Sure. Uh, the Carl Rennie Lewy Body Dementia Initiative was started because of the vision of Tamara Riel, whose husband, Carl Rennie, was a very talented professor here, a musician, an artist, scholar, who developed symptoms that were puzzling and horrifying. And over several years, no diagnosis was made. The diagnosis was finally made, and, and she decided upon his death that we needed to do a better job of educating the public and healthcare professionals and trainees about Lewy body dementia. And thus, the Carl Rennie Lewy body dementia initiative was begun. It's been going now for four and a half years. Really honored today to have Dr. Melissa Armstrong from the University of Florida to be our fourth annual speaker in the uh, series. Dr. Armstrong is a native of the Midwest. She grew up in the Illinois area, Chicago area, trained at Loyola for medical school. Little bit of movement disorders at Rush for a month and got hooked and decided to do a fellowship in movement disorders in Toronto. After, work, after which she was at the University of Maryland for several years and was recruited to University of Florida in 2015. She is an associate professor of neurology there head of the Lewy Body Dementia Program, uh, and has just rocketed up the ranks very quickly. She has over 70 publications. I've known her because I'm on the Lewy Body Dementia Association Research Centers of Excellence. And technically, I co-chair her with her on the Community Education Support Committee. I do nothing. Uh, <laughs> Melissa runs everything, and everyone at the LBDA knows that. I've been very impressed with her organizational and knowledge, organizational skills and knowledge. Uh, she d works for uh, the AAN in practice guidelines, uh, serves on numerous editorial boards. I'll stop talking about her. I'm delighted to have you here today. She gave a wonderful lecture yesterday to the community about LBDA. I heard wonderful things about that. We're very fortunate to have her here today. Dr. Armstrong. Thank you very much. Well, I very much appreciate the invitation to come. I'm very thankful it's not snowing here yet. Uh, we'll see if I escape, but the fall colors are glorious. So today we're going to talk about treating Lewy body dementia or dementia with Lewy bodies beyond medications. And I'll just say at the introduction that we don't have great medications for dementia with Lewy bodies, um, but we're not gonna talk about them really at all. I don't have any financial disclosures, but I am the PI for our Lewy Body Research Center of Excellence at UF. I serve on the LBDA Scientific Advisory Council. Uh, Hank mentioned that I work for the AAN as an evidence-based medicine consultant on the guideline program, and then I have some grant support. But none of this directly conflicts with the presentation. So today, while the focus on the talk is going to be strategies that we use to work with people with DLB without medications, we're going to start by taking a look at the diagnostic criteria and the vocabulary. Because there's a lot of confusion about the vocabulary of Lewy body dementia, and unless you have that core knowledge, it's really hard to go to the next step for treatment. We'll also briefly talk about clinical syndromes that are part of the prodromal state of DLB. There's a lot of interest in this area. And then we'll segue into non-pharmacologic treatment approaches. So for the trainees in the room, because I'm guessing that there are a wide range of individuals here, when we think about Lewy body dementia, we think about how we classify it both pathologically and how we classify it clinically. And so when we think of neurodegenerations just very broadly, we often think about this nucleinopathies and the tauopathies. And dementia with Lewy bodies, along with Parkinson's disease and multiple system atrophy, pure autonomic failure, they fall into that synucleinopathy bucket. When we think about tauopathies, from a movement disorder spec perspective, we think about 4R tauopathies like PSP and cortical basal. Alzheimer's is obviously a tauopathy as well with amyloid pathology. And then we know with DLB, there's a lot of overlap with Alzheimer's pathology, particularly amyloid. If you think of these clinically from a movement disorder perspective, you put them under this umbrella of Parkinsonism. You could, if you come at this from a dementia perspective, put it under the umbrella of dementia. I didn't want to have too many umbrella slides, so we're going with Parkinsonism here. So a Parkinsonism would be anything, I think I, you want to try? Okay, 
From a Parkinson perspective, you can think of anything that has Parkinson-like symptoms. So that could be stroke-related, that could be medication-related, that could be tauopathies or the synucleinopathies we discussed. And under that synuclein umbrella we talked about on the last slide, we have Parkinson's, we have MSA, but then we have Lewy body dementia. And Lewy body dementia itself is an umbrella term. And this umbrella term includes both Parkinson's disease dementia and dementia with Lewy bodies. So let's take a moment and pause on this vocabulary. So Lewy body dementia is that umbrella term with clinically diagnosed dementia with Lewy bodies and Parkinson's disease dementia. And then historically, when we think about DLB, we think about a condition where the dementia is present at onset or uh, prior to the Parkinsonism or that dementia occurs within one year of the onset of motor symptoms. So you don't have to have Parkinsonism to have DLB. When we think about Parkinson's disease dementia, historically, we've thought about people who have Parkinson's disease, often for many years, and then they develop the dementia. And then the term Lewy body disease is the pathologic diagnosis. When you see the synuclein aggregations and you see the Lewy bodies on pathology. So another way to think about this pathology, I really like this slide, so the kind of intersection of the clinical diagnoses and the pathologic diagnoses. I don't think this is, whoops. Uh, but you're going to get here in, in this uh, horizontal oval, you have Lewy body disease. Those are all the diseases that have Lewy, body, uh, Lewy bodies on pathology. Then here in the blue circles, you've got Parkinson's disease which is largely brainstem Lewy bodies and Parkinson's disease dementia with diffuse Lewy bodies. Now DLB also has diffuse Lewy bodies and it can have diffuse Lewy bodies with or without amyloid plaques. And then you have the amyloidopathies which includes Alzheimer's disease, but you can also see DLB with amyloid. So you've got your alpha synucleinopathies, your Lewy body diseases that includes both clinical presentations of PD, PDD, and dementia with Lewy bodies. So I bet there are some people in the audience right now saying, that's great for the specialists, that's kind of a hot mess. DLB and Lewy body dementia are different things, and then you've got Lewy body disease, like do I really need to remember all this? And while I agree that it's a hot mess of vocabulary, it does have clinical relevance for our patients. So I see a CEO and he came to me, I was his fourth opinion. He was told that he had Lewy body dementia. And when he was told he had Lewy body dementia, he was still working, but he thought, you know, I'm gonna do the right thing. Uh, he wrote an open letter to his company. He wrote an open letter to his collaborators. And he said, look, I've been diagnosed with Lewy body dementia and I'm gonna step down and I wanna be honest with everybody about why. But when he came to me, and this was a couple years later, we did neuropsychological testing and he was normal. His executive function probably wasn't quite what it used to be, but he was normal. He had REM sleep behavior disorder. He had a little bit of Parkinsonism, probably not even enough to count as Parkinson's disease yet. He got orthostatic when he exercised. So he had a number of the different symptoms that we'll talk about suggest a synucleinopathy, but he couldn't possibly have dementia with Lewy bodies or Lewy body dementia because he was not demented. He didn't even meet criteria for MCI. And when I looked back, so I requested all his records, like how did this happen? And I saw in one of the records that it said that he was diagnosed with Lewy body disease. And I can only think that someone gave him the Lewy body disease diagnosis and he heard Lewy body dementia. And then, you know, he stepped down and followed this course. And he said to me recently, he said, what did they do to me? I gave up everything because I thought I had Lewy body dementia and now I've lost my company, I have nothing to do, I have no work, like they ruined my life. And so it is really important, not only what term we use, because it may be that, I mean, it's probably correct, he does have a Lewy body disease, he has all the prodromal features, and now he meets criteria for Parkinson's. But it's important not only the terms we use, but also what we tell people. 
so that they understand what they have and what to expect. Now, when we think about diagnostic criteria, you don't need to read the slide. I'm gonna tell you what you need to know from it. There's been a lot of confusion in the last five years about what we should be calling these diseases. And I will tell you, there is no consensus on this. In June, we had the Lewy Body Dementia Conference. This is still a very sore subject. Uh, there is no consensus. But what happened in 2015 is that in movement disorders, the Movement Disorder Society came out with new criteria for Parkinson's disease. And up until 2015, if you had dementia at onset, that was generally considered an exclusion criterion for Parkinson's. And then if you had dementia at onset, you were kind of shuttled into more of a dementia with Lewy body type uh, uh, vocabulary. But in these Parkinson's disease diagnostic criteria, if you look at the absolute exclusion criteria, they removed the exclusion of dementia at onset. So now if you meet criteria for Parkinson's disease, it doesn't really matter what your cognitive state is. If you meet physical criteria for Parkinson's, then you are Parkinson's regardless of whether you have that dementia onset or not. Well, you can imagine that this has caused some consternation because all of a sudden now, anyone with DLB with Parkinsonism can be called Parkinson's disease. And then you're not quite sure what to do with these DLBs without Parkinsonism. And so if you're interested in the pro and con about this, I commend these two articles for you. These were published in 2016. And basically people in the dementia with Lewy body world said, this doesn't make any sense. Uh, and then the people in the Parkinson's world who wrote the criteria, they say, you know, the one year rule is totally arbitrary, which is completely true. Everyone agrees on that. Uh, the pathology is similar, if not identical. And I think what you'll find if you read these two articles is you read one, they're all written by well-respected experts. You read one and you're like, oh, that makes so much sense. They should be separate. And then you read the next one, you're like, oh, that should make so much, that makes so much sense. They should be the same. Uh, so the, the key point is, is that there is still kind of debate on what we should be calling these things. How do we categorize them? And this also, some of you may be thinking, oh, it's not what I do, but it matters because when you read articles in the literature, you need to know how they're defining these things. So if you're reading articles about Parkinson's disease dementia, are they talking about our conventional view, you know, where they've had PD for all, some amount of time and now they have dementia? Or does Parkinson's disease dementia include DLB as well? Some clinical trials now, there's a clinical trial for PD dementia, but because they're using the new PD criteria, it's enrolling people with dementia with Lewy bodies too, as long as they have Parkinsonism. Uh, if you read articles about DLB and PD dementia and cognitive impairment in the literature, some of them are using the DLB criteria and some of them are using the Parkinson's criteria. And so it's a little bit of a mess. And so these are things to keep in mind as you're both looking at clinical trials and as you're reviewing the literature. And I think one of the things that decides how you feel about this is how you want to classify diseases. So I'll be honest, I'm on the DLB end of this. And that's really for two reasons. One is that uh, I work in the DLB space, but the second one is I am very clinical. And you're gonna see this when I present some of my research. I really take a, you know, I'm all about seeing patients in clinic and working with patients and families. And it can be really difficult to tell people with what I would consider DLB, oh, you have Parkinson's. They're gonna tell me I'm insane. They're gonna go read about Parkinson's and they're gonna be like, but this doesn't match me at all. People are with Parkinson's are, they have the tremor and you know they have years before they're disabled and they're still working and my loved one can't even get dressed and is hallucinating. So to me, the reason I argue for keeping them separate is really that patient-based view, that it doesn't make any sense to my patients and families if I tell them they have Parkinson's, even if I tell them it's a form of Parkinson's, and then they go read about it and they find nothing that matches their own clinical experience. Where if they go read about DLB, they're like, oh yeah, hallucinations. You know, they think that I have an affair and I'm not having an affair. That resonates with them much more. 
Now, the truth is, is that depending on who you read, the pathology is either identical or very close. So we know that these are different sides of the same coin. And maybe when we have synuclein biomarkers, we'll be identifying all of these things as Lewy body diseases, Parkinson type, DLB type. Um, but for now, I, I keep them separate because I think that's more helpful to my patients and families. So from a DLB diagnostic criteria perspective, we're not gonna go through all of these, but kind of the core features are you have to have dementia. That dementia is usually with deficits in attention, uh, visual perceptual reasoning and executive function. Usually memory isn't a big part of the neuropsychological abnormalities, though many of them complain of memory concerns. And then the core clinical features are fluctuating cognition where they really have a lot of ups and downs. Sometimes they look near normal. Other times they're totally confused. These recurrent visual hallucinations, REM sleep behavior disorder, and Parkinsonism that's not triggered by drugs. The biomarkers we can use are a DAT scan. I don't know how helpful that is if they have Parkinsonism as well. And then PSG confirmation of REM sleep without atonia. And then there are a lot of supportive clinical features that you'll hear about when you see these individuals in clinic. So they have postural instability and falls early. Doesn't have to be PSP if they're falling. You've got to think about things like DLB as well. Uh, syncope and episodes where they don't respond. They have a lot of autonomic dysfunction. So constipation, orthostasis, urinary incontinence, this excessive daytime sleepiness, hallucinations outside vision, uh, delusions, and then anxiety and depression and apathy. Now there is a lot of overlap here. So I think one of the cautions I often give my trainees is that, you know, it, it's, it's really a mixed picture. When you see some of the things, if you see orthostatic hypotension, some of the reflex I've seen has been, oh, maybe it's MSA. But we see orthostasis and DLB all the time, and it also happens in Parkinson's disease, sometimes even early. Um, the, the more rapid progression we see in DLB and MSA, that early autonomic failure, the postural instability and falls. You know, so, so when we think about synucleinopathies, there's really a lot of overlap, which makes some sense because it's overlapping pathology. Now, again, you don't have to read all of this, but this is the um, original prodromal criteria for Parkinson's disease published in 2015. And I saw just a couple days ago that the Movement Disorder Society published ahead of print a revised prodromal criteria. But I didn't change the table because the prodromal criteria are really the same. The only thing that's changed is the likelihood ratios. And what I want to point out with this slide, so in these prodromal research criteria for Parkinson's, the prodromal markers, which are here, I'm going to read them to you so you don't have to read them. So PSG proven REM sleep behavior disorder or using a positive screening questionnaire with a, a good validated screening questionnaire. So REM sleep behavior disorder, Parkinsonism, olfactory loss, constipation, excessive daytime sleepiness, orthostatic hypotension, severe erectile dysfunction, urinary dysfunction and depression. So hold those in your mind. This article is about uh, developing prodromal criteria for DLB, and the prodromal criteria are decreased sense of smell, REM sleep behavior disorder, constipation, orthostasis, uh, urinary incontinence, uh, delirium, depression, Parkinsonism. They're the same. You know, and so these aren't formalized yet. The DLB uh, consortium is working on these, but this was an article about you know, working on developing these di diagnostic criteria for prodromal DLB. But the honest truth is, is there is a lot of overlap in these diseases, even at the prodromal state. Uh, you know, they're having many of the same prodromal features. So there's no doubt that there's a strong overlap between these diseases, both in prodromal periods and also in when they fully clinically manifest. So we know that DLB in the, in the studies we have, it accounts for about 4% of new dementia diagnoses. The prevalence is about 4% in community and about 7.5% in secondary care. 
But we really think this is an underestimate. There's been some work done on how often DLB is missed or goes undiagnosed, and it's currently estimated that one in three cases never receives a diagnosis of DLB. And in people who do eventually get a diagnosis of DLB, and we heard about this in the introduction, often it is many years and many visits before people get that correct diagnosis. So in this work from Jim Galvin, who has been a speaker for you before, almost 70% needed to see three different doctors about their symptoms of DLB before they got a diagnosis. And 15% saw five different physicians before they got a diagnosis. The mean number of office visits to get that diagnosis was about four, uh, but 33% required more than six, and only half got the diagnosis in the first year. So we know that we're not doing a very good job in the medicine system of recognizing this and getting people to a diagnosis. And so as we transition to treating DLB beyond medications, I think it really starts with this. It's getting people to that diagnosis. Now, some people will still say, you know, does it really matter? You can't do anything about it. Like, you know, we can't do anything about any of them. So does it matter if they're DLB or ADE or dementia not otherwise specified? But if you talk to patients and caregivers about this, it matters. So why does it matter to them? This is from a number of different research studies. They want to understand what's happening. It's really bothersome when you know there's a problem and you don't know what it is. Families say it also makes them more patient with the person with dementia. Okay, so th this isn't them being annoying. This is a brain disease. It's a validation that something's wrong. This is a big one for caregivers, especially there are some caregivers who keep going back to their doctors and saying, I can tell something's wrong, something's not right, something's changed. And when you give them the diagnosis, it's that validation that yes, you were right, something was wrong. It helps you and them establish a treatment plan. It can get connected to various resources. It helps their decision-making and future planning. So that includes obvious things like advanced directives, but also financial planning, power of attorney, uh, and then when you talk to early dementia patients, they talk about a right to know. Now, there are some people who don't want the diagnosis, and so sometimes in my clinic, I'll even ask them what they want to know so that I can be responsive to what they want, but the vast majority of research suggests that people want a diagnosis and that it's helpful to have a diagnosis, even if we don't have curative or disease-modifying therapy. And this is one of my patients who I think really brought this home uh, for me, although it was something I already believed in, and he has given me permission to tell this story. So this is Ray. I knew him just as Ray, but the rest of the world knew him as the first CEO of Atari. And when he came to me with his husband, he had a bunch of kind of somewhat vague symptoms. He was slower than he used to be. He wasn't thinking as well. He couldn't hold up conversations when they went to parties. Uh, he couldn't remember people's names. He had episodes where he would blank, and people had trouble kind of getting him to respond. And he had been seen elsewhere and said, oh, you have someone in the Parkinson's family. And he met criteria for probable DLB. And I went through the checklist. The LBDA, I think, has a really helpful checklist about common symptoms in DLB. I'll often print that in clinic, and we'll go through and we'll check off all the symptoms they have. And that's very persuasive. People, you know, they see you've checked off 75% of the list. Oh yeah, like this fits me perfectly. And they asked me after I gave the diagnosis of dementia with Lewy bodies, well, what did I expect to happen? What, what's gonna happen next? Uh, when am I gonna die? And based on his age and some other things going on in his health, my estimate for him um, and what I told him was that I thought he had six to 18 months to live. Now, you can imagine that that was a hard conversation. Here I am giving them a diagnosis of a brain disease that I can't cure, I can't slow down, and in his case, I'm saying he has six to 18 months to live. And they told me later that on the plane ride on the way home, that it was the best day of their lives because they finally had an explanation for what was going on. They finally knew what to expect. 
They could cancel, they had more consults planned. They canceled them all, and they could get on with the business of living. And when he died almost exactly 12 months later, they said it was the best year of their marriage, they did exactly what they wanted to do, and he died how he wanted to die, at home with his husband and his dogs at his side. That's a powerful diagnosis. I didn't do much for him. I stopped his antihypertensive, which was making him orthostatic. I connected him to hospice in the last few months, but I didn't change what was happening. It was the, getting the diagnosis that really made a big difference for him. And so I think it's really important to remember with this disease that, that giving a diagnosis is part of your treatment and it can be very powerful. So now you've given the diagnosis, what's next? Well, the research suggests that people really want to know what's going to happen. And so there's research across dementias, DLB, Alzheimer's, frontotemporal dementia, young onset dementia, dementia not specified. In the research with these patients and with their families, they say one of the big gaps in care is they want to know what is happening. And so for Ray, I was able to tell him just based on my clinical experience, but using, he supported some of our research then, and so we did some research about, well, what should you expect in DLB? I told him what I thought just based on what I've seen in my clinic. Let's look at what should people with dementia with Lewy bodies expect. So we did a survey with the Lewy Body Dementia Association where we surveyed individuals whose loved one had died with dementia with Lewy bodies in the last five years. So caregivers, family. Um, we had over 600 people respond to the survey in less than a month. And we asked them various questions about their end of life experiences. And I'm gonna pause just a moment for the trainees in the room. I think this is a really good way to think about research. Your patients ask you something you don't know. You go to the literature and you can't find it. That's a great research question because I'm sure other people are asking it too. And this was a pretty, so surveys have pros and cons, but we got a lot of people in a short amount of time. And I think it's one part of finding this answer. And what we found was that of these over 600 participants, the median time from diagnosis to death with DLB was three to four years. Now, when I've told people this, a lot of people say, well, that seems kind of short, like that's pretty fast. But we pulled, so there are two other clinical cohorts. So this is clinically diagnosed dementia with Lewy bodies. These were smaller, but they had different study uh, approaches, uh, and it's exactly the same. 3.2 years in one study, 3.7 years in another study. So with different, different places in the world, different study designs, we're finding very consistent results that the median time from diagnosis to death is three to four years. But there's a really wide range. So you'll see that, you know, you can see that in that graph, you know, less than a one year. This is one of the rapidly progressive dementias, so that's not the most typical presentation, and people over 10 years. And, Definitely at the community lecture I uh, was at yesterday, there were people there who had lived with it for over 10 years. This is a little bit lower than some of the clinical pathologic series. So if you look like at the Mayo data, they have a lot of pathological data. Their time from diagnosis to death is a little bit longer. And there are various explanations for that. So it could be individuals with you know, more resources if they're being seen at Mayo. They're followed very intensely because they're part of this clinical pathologic series. You know, they're people who have consented to autopsy. That's a select group. Um, but the, the disease duration is a little bit longer if you look at the pathologic series. From uh, symptom onset to death, uh, not surprising, because I told you it often takes several years to get a diagnosis. We found a median of five to six years between symptom onset and death, and that's also consistent with the 5.3 year duration reported in another study. So I do talk to my patients and families about this data. I don't over-focus on three to four years because we see this widespread, but it is important to know that this is a, a dementia diagnosis that can progress fairly quickly over a matter of years, and that's generally faster than what's seen in Alzheimer's disease. Well, then they say, okay, so now I'm, I'm gonna have this for you know, some amount of years, how am I gonna die? And I couldn't believe it when I went to the literature and this had, had never ever been reported. 
Well, that's a huge gap. So we asked in the survey, how are you dying? How is your loved one dying? How did they die from DLD? And we let them pick more than one thing. So there was some overlap, but the most common cause of death was failure to thrive. Or sometimes in some dementia literature, they'll call it the dwindles. They just kind of stop getting out of bed. They stop eating, they stop drinking, you know, and then they just stop and they, they die often on hospice. That is a really important thing for our patients and families to know. And it's an important thing for us to know because that changes what we're going to do with their management. We need to get them in hospice. You know, we need to talk about palliative care, palliative care really from the time of diagnosis and then hospice towards the end of life. And number two was pneumonia or aspiration. I don't think that's a big surprise to people in the audience. We also see this in people with advanced Parkinson's and probably some of that difficulty swallowing plays into the failure to thrive. They're not eating and drinking because they're having trouble swallowing. Number three as a group was medical conditions of which infection, non-pneumonia infection was the most common, but a variety. Uh, and number four was falls or complications of a fall. So the top three, or the top three of the top four here are DLB related. These are people who are dying most of the time from their disease. Now we also allowed write-in responses, and I think it was interesting to note that 1% of respondents reported that their loved one died after administration of an antipsychotic. Now, in not all of these was that the kind of the direct cause of death, so at least one of these occurred in someone on hospice who was getting how, who received haloperidol on hospice and had a neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Um, so these are patients, some of them that were going to die perhaps shortly anyway, um, but 1% wrote in that the immediate death occurred after an antipsychotic, and then 1% wrote in that their loved one died of suicide. And there's really not a lot of literature about suicide and dementia with Lewy bodies, but obviously in the last few years, there have been some high profile occurrences of this. And so this is something that's really important to keep in mind in your clinical care, that you're asking about depression and suicide in these individuals. So then we asked, well, okay, you know, did people talk about end of life? We didn't know these other results yet when we did this survey. And 40% of these family members said that their physician discussed what to do, what to expect at the end of life. But only 22% said their physician discussed it to a helpful degree. And usually those conversations were initiated by the caregiver. When we think about non-pharmacologic approaches, I mean, this has got to be high on the list of one of the things we're thinking about. We should be talking about what to expect, preparing, palliative care, what we can do. For these individuals, death was usually expected, but fewer than half of them felt prepared for what to expect. And 78% did use hospice uh, for a median of one to two months. But if you look at this graph, you'll see that, you know, I, uh, the largest portion of hospice here was less than a week. We're too late, less than a week. That's too late. You know, and I did follow-up interviews. I'm not going to talk about the interviews today, but I interviewed 30 of the people who participated. And this was a common theme, like I had to ask about hospice. My doctor said I wasn't ready for hospice. I wish I had known about hospice. I could have gotten a hospital bed. I could have gotten continence pads. I paid for all of those things out of pocket. You know, finances are a huge concern. Like we need to get them the resources they need to live and die well. And so I think if you take one thing home today, that would be one of the big things we should be doing. That's not a drug, but makes a huge difference to their lives. Uh, so number three, I, I've kind of already talked about it in that initial section, think about palliative care and hospice. If you have palliative care programs here, those are really appropriate from the time of diagnosis, but hospice is really predicting that last six month window. Now, we're not very good at predicting the last six month window. Medicare does have hospice guidelines for dementia. Um, uh, those aren't great, but those are things like um, if they're not eating and drinking well, uh, if they're losing weight, uh, if they're not getting out of bed anymore, if they can't ambulate independently, um, if they're incontinent of urine and bowel, if they're not really talking anymore, if they have severe bed sores, recurrent sepsis, I mean, things that are kind of obvious. And so I do use those, you know, 
heading that way as red flags, but I think if you formally meet the dementia guidelines for hospice, it's probably too late. So I try to anticipate some of those uh, criteria from Medicare. And then also in some of our research, those things really don't account for what gets worse in DLB, worsening hallucinations, worsening Parkinsonism, more daytime sleepiness. And so hopefully we've submitted along with uh, Michigan a grant to, to better look at predictors of end of life in DLB. So maybe in five years you'll have me back and we'll have data on that. So treating DLB beyond medications for, so using therapy and local resources. So this is my one plug for our center. We just opened a new building and this is my favorite part. So in our new building, we have an interdisciplinary movement disorder and dementia clinic. We have our own PTOT speech on site and we have an indoor outdoor therapy center. And so here, our therapist can work outside when it's not a thousand degrees. Uh, on gravel, so patients can practice how to walk on gravel. This is walking on sand, a couple different kinds of pavers. And then we live in Florida, so we have a putting green they can work on in Florida uh, in therapy. And then we also have exterior steps, so they can work on steps going to a, a door uh, to practice the steps and doors. It's a door to nowhere other than a little balcony, but uh, I really do like our, our new therapy center. And why therapy? Well, most of this is kind of extrapolated from the Parkinson's disease literature. There's not a lot of literature about therapy and exercise in DLB. These are a couple of publications in Parkinson's. So every year the Movement Disorder Society updates their evidence-based recommendations for care. And you could see here that physiotherapy is determined to be likely efficacious and clinically useful, less evidence for other kinds of therapy there's more and more evidence that exercise helps people with Parkinson's. This is a review from Nature Reviews and a physiotherapy review from Cochrane. I mean, I just feel like every week there's a new publication about how much exercise and therapy helps people with Parkinson's. And so we kind of take that data from Parkinson's and says, well, it's probably gonna help people with DLB2, <laughs> at the very least keeping them active. Now, I have the good fortune of having therapists at my center but even if you don't have easy access to occupational therapy as a physician, you can be thinking about a lot of these non-pharmacologic approaches yourself. So these are things that I have discussed with people who I have with DLB and their families, even though I have occupational therapy. Um, so, you know, we often talk about bars in the bathroom, by the toilet, in the shower, and some people live in an apartment or they don't have anyone to install those things. And there are useful devices like this one here that clamps onto the side of the tub that you can get on Amazon and can really help people with that shower and tub safety. Another big problem for caregivers is sleep overnight. So if sleep is disrupted for the person with DLB, uh, either because that's part of the disease or because they're getting up to pee, the caregiver sleeps very lightly because they don't want the person with DLB to get up in a fall and then they're not sleeping and sleep is one of the biggest caregiver issues. So this is a mat, you have them in the hospital often. You can put it under a little rug or put it at the side of the bed and it alarms when someone steps on it. This is a picture from Amazon. They can order this for themselves. You put it at the side of the bed and that way if the person with DLB gets up overnight, it sings Mary had a little lamb or something and the caregiver can wake up. And that way they can sleep more deeply, feeling more confident that they would wake up if the person with DLB gets out of bed. We talked about exercise, but for my patients with DLB with a lot of gait impairments, I'm not a big fan of treadmill. We want to exercise, but we want to exercise safely. I don't like stand-up bikes because then they're on one leg trying to get their leg over. Balance is not good, so I don't want them to have to get their leg over an upright bike but they also have a lot of trouble getting on and off the floor. So your conventional recumbent can be a little difficult. Well, now they have these chair bikes where it, you know, it's at chair level or even the desk bike. Some of you may have these under your desk where all you do is you get the pedals. So there are ways to help people exercise that take some of those safety concerns out. Getting in and out of bed is often a huge issue, but these are things you can get them at Walmart, Home Depot, Amazon. You know, it slips between the mattresses to help people get in and out of bed. 
So these are all very practical strategies that you can be thinking about yourself or with an occupational therapist to help make day-to-day -day life better. And then when we think about social support, so Michigan really has a tremendous infrastructure for this. So you have six Lewy body dementia support groups. That's amazing. Um, so think about support groups, social work. So I read on your website, you have a social worker through your cognitive disorders clinic. Think also about state services that you can connect people to. So I took this screenshot from the Michigan uh, Department of Health and Human Services. They have aging and adult services. It talks about adult daycare, counseling, respite care, support groups, training. Those are all really important things for caregivers. So think about those different things and then connect them to the LBDA. The LBDA is really a tremendous resource in this area. So treating beyond medications number five, prepare them for the expected. So we think about things like hospitalization as being unexpected, but if you look at the literature about Lewy body dementia, uh, which is this study in general, we, this should not be unexpected. So in this survey that Jim Gallivan did, almost a thousand participants, caregivers, 64% of them reported a crisis situation in the prior year. So 64%, we should really be expecting a crisis for these patients and their families. And the most frequent place they went to get help was the hospital emergency room. So this is common. We should be thinking about this and preparing our patients and families for this possibility. And when we look at, there are a few studies looking at hospitalization in Lewy body dementia. Broadly, um, it found that uh, hospitalization is more common in DLB than AD. This is a study out of Britain that the mean number of hospital days per person year for DLB was 10. And in this British study, the drivers of longer hospital stays were poorer physical health, health and neuropsychiatric symptoms. And certainly that's very common if you look at the dementia literature in general, the number one driver of hospitalization in dementia in general is neuropsychiatric symptoms. And so we did a study at UF. Dr. Spears was the first author on this study, who you have here now. And we looked at causes and outcomes of hospitalization of LBD in our hospital. So these are not really patients we followed in our clinic. These were all comers. We just looked at the hospital data over a two year period. And we found that 117 people with a diagnosis of Lewy body dementia were admitted over those two years, and it was about 170 hospitalizations. About 70% were hospitalized once, but 30% had two or more hospitalizations. And we found that when people had repeated hospitalizations, they often had to do with symptoms relating to either their Lewy body dementia or infection. So for those people with two to four admissions, over 60%, every single admission was either an LBD-related symptom or infection or both, because infection often leads to delirium in people with dementia with Lewy bodies. And so hallucinations, confusion, failure to thrive, falls, syncope. Um, and when we looked at the most common reasons for hospitalizations, the number one was hallucination or confusion. Number two was falls. Number three was infection, most commonly UTI, and followed by pneumonia, and then uh, various other diagnoses. But really, the, the top three were hallucinations, falls, and infection. And if you look at a couple other papers where they looked at reason in, in dementia with Lewy bodies, or one looked at Parkinsonism-related dementia uh, and what their admissions were, these top three, they're pretty consistent. Hallucinations, confusion, falls, and infection. Those are the most common reasons these individuals get admitted. Well, then they're admitted what happens, and I would guess at University of Michigan, your experience would probably be somewhat similar to ours. Only 12% of these individuals were admitted to neurology, probably because they were admitted to medicine for their infection or, or something else. It was a little shocking, though, that only about 35% of them had a neurology or a psychiatry consult while they were in the hospital. So we're not often participating in the care of these individuals. Hospital complications were pretty common. So delirium occurred in half. I was actually surprised it was only half. Um, and that might be partly how it was coded or written. 17% uh, developed pneumonia while they were in the hospital, 5% fell while they were in the hospital, and 5% died in the hospital. 
Antipsychotic medications were used in 40%. That's almost exactly on target with what's been published for dementia in general. And the antipsychotics were new or increased in 19%. It was usually quetiapine, but we saw the whole gamut, haloperidol, risperidone, all of them. And so we looked at length of stay, and there were several things that associated with a longer length of stay. So if they were delirious at admission, if they developed delirium during the hospital stay, if they developed pneumonia, if they fell, basically any in-hospital complication, they were there longer, probably not super surprising. We also found that antipsychotic administration other than quetiapine or clozapine, the two generally considered to be safer in DLB, hemovanserin wasn't out in the years that we did this study, was associated with a longer hospital stay. Now you'll know I'm using associated very intentionally. The study could not show causation. And so it may be that they were in the hospital longer because they had worse hallucinations, worse delirium. You couldn't get them off to rehab. And that's why you were having to try a bunch of antipsychotics. So it's not necessarily that the antipsychotics caused the longer hospitalization, but it was associated with a longer hospitalization. And we didn't find other uh, associations uh, in the analysis, though. Um, it didn't have a lot of power. And we looked at, well, where were they when they came into the hospital and where were they when they went home? And for 63% of the admissions, people were admitted from home. But you see that not a little bit more than half of them were able to go home. So this is another thing you need to be thinking about. Many of you will take care of these patients in the hospital, you know, thinking about what is their discharge disposition and discussing that with them early so that they and their families know what to expect. About 14% went to rehab from hospital. And then I think this is a pretty important thing to note. So I told you about the 5% who died, but another 11% went on hospice with their hospitalization. So 16% in this cohort of individuals with DLB either died or went on hospice after their hospitalization. So even if, you know, presumably if these patients are coming to you in the hospital, not on hospice, this is something, especially if they're really advanced or really sick that you have to keep in mind, but this might fall on you. And it might fall on you if they're seeing community physicians and maybe this hasn't been brought up yet too. So one third of the hospitalizations resulted in a transition to some higher level of care. Um, and again, when we thought of, looked at, well, what correlated with a transition to a high level care, the only uh, statistically significant odds ratio uh, was for antipsychotic use other than quetiapine or clozapine, though it had a pretty wide range with the confidence intervals. So, you know, I, I'm telling you, well, you should prepare them for the expected. How might you do that? Well, one way we do this is by using these medical alert cards. These are available free, free through the LBDA. And these are cards that they can just keep in their wallet. On one side, it includes information about their medical care. And on the other side, it talks about emergency treatment of psychosis in Lewy body dementia and medications to avoid. So they don't have to remember, it's always with them. They can keep it in their pocket. So this is one way I encourage my patients with LBD to be ready for hospitalization. The LBDA also has a website with caregiver tips for hospital stays, so I direct people to this. And then if we think about Lewy body dementia broadly, including those with Parkinson's disease dementia, the Parkinson's Foundation has resources to get people with Parkinson's ready for hospitalization. This is an aware and care kit. We keep them in our clinic to hand out, but people can also request one for free directly from the Parkinson Foundation. And this gets people ready. What do I need to think about before I go to hospital? What are the problems I might have in the hospital? There's a little booklet about hospitalization in PD. And so this can be a good resource for many patients and families. This is the aware and care hospital action plan that both comes in this resource and can also be ordered separately. Also available online as a PDF. So treating dementia with Lewy bodies beyond medication number six, so making decisions together. So there are often throughout neurology, not just dementia with Lewy bodies, there's not a right answer. There's not a best thing to do. 
And for all of our patients, we should be thinking about shared decision-making with our patients and our caregivers. Now, I could give you a whole talk on shared decision-making, but this is my last item, and I want to have a few minutes for questions. But the idea with shared decision-making is that we're going to make the best decision for any given patient and family by knowing their values and priorities, and then bringing the best medical evidence and partnering to make a decision. And so it really is important if you're gonna care for these patients well to know what their top priorities are. What's the biggest problem at home? Is it the walking? Let's get them into PT. Is it the cognition? Well, maybe we should, this isn't about pharmacologic management, but maybe we should try a cholinesterase inhibitor for what it's worth. Is psychosis a big issue? Do we need to try to treat it? Is it sleep? Is it urination? You know, we can't change the DLB, but we can make a lot of these things better. What's the biggest issue for the caregiver? You don't want to forget the caregiver in this, because if patient sleep is preventing the caregiver from sleeping, you can make a tremendous difference in both of their lives by helping sleep. There's some research now on using desmopressin in older individuals with nocturia. That's the bedwetting drug. I've given it to a few people with DLB. It's changed their lives because they're sleeping through the night and their caregiver is sleeping through the night and the days are better because they're both sleeping through the night. So there are many ways that you can help these individuals by talking through what their priorities for care is. And it's important to note that sometimes you need to, you, know, you shouldn't be constrained by rules. So we talked about how antipsychotics are risky for people with DLB, totally true. But sometimes you still have to think about them, and that's what this article is about. You know, I went to a pro-con, are antipsychotics good or bad in DLB? It was the stupidest debate ever, they're bad for DLB, okay? So they both said the same thing, it was very disappointing, and that's what prompted this article. I'm like, that was the most useless debate ever, you both gave the same information about how uh, antipsychotics are risky for DLB. It's totally true. Um, but the point is, if someone is uh, aggressive towards their spouse, they are hallucinating, uh, they, it, they can't stay at home anymore um, if, if we don't do something because of the aggression and the delusions and the hallucinations, and Seroquel hasn't helped, and uh, they didn't tolerate clozapine, well, you might have to try one of those antipsychotics anyway. Yes, they're riskier, but we know care in a, a facility is almost never as good at care at home. So maybe we need to use a touch of risperidone to try to keep people at home and control those behaviors. And so it's all about shared decision-making. What are the priorities? What are the risks? What are the benefits? And sometimes we need to do things we wouldn't do as a routine standard of care. Uh, so to just sum it up, I reordered them a little bit to make it uh, kind of flow better at the end. So uh, what did we talk about today about how we treat DLB beyond medication? So give the diagnosis. That itself is very powerful. Tell them what to expect. Use therapy and the many local resources you have here. Prepare them for the expected. Make decisions together and then use palliative care and hospice care. Uh, and those, so this is just a thank you to uh, our various funders. So thank you very much. Um, thank you. That was a great talk. I, my question has to do with the practical function in the clinic. Often I think it's not, it can't fall to the physician to provide all this level of education and personal care, is, and I'm wondering what you have or what you recommend for maybe physician-led teams that can provide the kinds of services. So I'll, full disclosure, I always run late. <laughs> uh, maybe not a surprise. Uh, so I do do a lot of this education myself because I, while I have a strong team in general, uh, I am the main Lewy body dementia specialist at UF. So some of this Lewy body specific education I provide uh, I am fortunate that I have a very strong therapy team, and so they will provide things like I showed you with the occupational therapy, all those different resources. I mostly leave to that my, my occupational therapy team. Um, if they are uh, seeing my patient, 
I do have social workers, so some of the things about caregiver burden, uh, connecting to local resources, I, I defer that to my social work team. I kind of briefly comment on what might be available, but then leave it to the social worker to discuss what uh, resources they might be particularly available to. Uh, we have a, a virtual support group now where we discuss some of these things, but right now I'm running many of our virtual support group sessions, so that hasn't yet uh, taken something off my plate, but it does let me do it in a little bit more of a group setting. Um, I do think, so certainly in the Parkinson's model, a lot of clinics have Parkinson's uh, advanced practice providers who provide education. Uh, we have some of that in Parkinson's, but they don't yet know enough about DLB to really take over that role. But I think as our clinic expands, we might have more like a DLB educator, or we have like, we have a Parkinson's day program for newly diagnosed Parkinson's. It would be great as my clinic expands if we can have a DLB day program. But right now from the counseling part of it, it's still a lot me, uh, and that means I always run late. <laughs> but you have a great DLB team. So the question for those who couldn't hear it is um, under the 2017 criteria, you can have possible and probable DLB. And so what is the recommendation for diagnosing possible DLB? And then also the acknowledgement that a lot of dementia diagnoses occur at the primary care level. So how would we counsel primary care physicians on making diagnoses? So I think that second part, how do you partner with primary care? It's a huge issue uh, for dementia in general. Uh, how do we collaborate? Uh, what is the role of primary care in making a dementia diagnosis? How do we collaborate? How do we improve diagnosis at the level of the primary care physician? Um, and I think that is a, a really big issue that spans dementias. Certainly people who come to me straight from a primary care clinic, which isn't super common, often just have this kind of generic dementia diagnosis. But that's unsatisfying for a lot of them because they don't really feel like they know what they have, uh, and they also don't know what to do about it. And it's harder to connect to any kind of resource if you don't have a label. Um, so, uh, you know, having an Alzheimer label, then you can connect to the Alzheimer's Association. They handle all dementias, but you know, the focus is really on Alzheimer's. Having a Lewy body dementia label gets you into the Lewy body dementia association. And so having that label really does kind of give people a sense of identity. Now, with regards to this issue of false positive and false negative diagnoses, uh, we uh, did some research where we talked to, uh, we're developing a guideline for the AAN about amyloid imaging. And with that, uh, we also did a survey of both physicians, patients, caregivers, advocates about some of their views on diagnosis. Um, and what we found is that physicians were really worried about giving the wrong diagnosis to the point where if they weren't sure, they wouldn't give a diagnosis at all. And this is certainly borne out in the literature. There are a lot of articles about why people aren't giving dementia diagnoses. They're afraid they're wrong. The therapeutic nihilism, there's nothing to do. Uh, they feel lack of confidence in their abilities to either make the diagnosis or give the diagnosis. But when we talk to patients and caregivers, they, they want a diagnosis. And they even erred to, to prefer to having a false positive diagnosis because at least it gives them something to work with. Uh, it gives them some sense of feeling like they know what's going on. And so while our physicians really erred on avoiding false positive diagnoses, uh, the patient said, we want to know even if you're wrong to begin with. Um, that's you know, going to vary some from person to person. Uh, I usually give DLB diagnoses when, I, when it's probable. When it's possible, I still think there's a lot of room, and so we'll discuss that it's a possible diagnosis and that we need to keep reevaluating over time. One last question. 
Hi, um, thanks so much for your presentation. Um, I was curious, so it seems like research has shown that uh, the expected um, uh, time after the diagnosis is something like three to four years. And for the CEO that you mentioned earlier, um, you said it was, I think, something like around nine to 12 months, which is actually uh, pretty accurate. And I was wondering, what were the factors that you were thinking of when um, tell, giving him that, like, precision, like, just thought? Sure. So the patient I saw where I told him I gave him a six to 18 month, and he passed away over 12. What, what made me think that six to 18 months? Um, well, some of it was his age, so he was 90. Um, he also had other medical conditions uh, that kind of played into that. And then also he had some of those red flags that I look for. He was already a lot less mobile. He was eating less. Uh, he was having a lot of disability from his symptoms, not only the motor symptoms, but the orthostasis and the cognition. Um, and I'll admit some of it, you know, I see a lot of these patients, so some of it's still a gut feel. Um, but it was a combination of uh, his DLB symptoms, his age, his comorbidities, and then, you know, kind of the approaching of some of those red flags that I use for hospice. Before we thank you, I wanted to say I can't imagine a better discussion of Lewy body in our room. So much of what we do as doctors is not giving medication. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.